Yellowstone supervolcano, why the U.S. Geological Survey scientists were very nervous after increased seismic activity. This was published uh, May 24th, Express UK, Callum Hoare reports concerning what the U.S. Geological Survey, Yellowstone and Volcano Observatory informed them. Yellowstone supervolcano scientists experienced a very nervous time during a period of increased activity. This was uh, revealed during their lecture. Yellowstone Volcano, as we know, sits between the U.S. states and Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho inside the Yellowstone National Park. It's one of the most dangerous, dangerous supervolcanoes, and uh, it has erupted three times, three supervolcanic eruptions in the past two million years at the location where the Yellowstone Lake is today, which is the caldera. The magma chamber roof is right under the lake. There has been three super eruptions at that location. One was at 2.1 million years ago. Another one was 1.3 million years ago, and then 640 or 630 thousand years ago, there was a, a less, uh, a lesser eruption at 70 thousand years ago, and there have been at least 80 eruptions since then. Uh, Lowenstein, who gave this lecture, says that it erupts about just about every 6,000 years, and he claimed that we are overdue 10,000 years for a large, serious eruption. Not a super eruption, which would be worldwide catastrophe, but a large eruption which would be devastating for the nation, nonetheless. So inside Yellowstone National Park, the caldera, labeled supervolcano because Due to its capacity to inflict disaster on a worldwide scale, if another super eruption would occur, the last event of the kind was not happened has not happened for more than 630 years, and the serious eruption, as we said, was 70,000 years ago, reportedly makes another event of this kind overdue, according to this lecture. In December 2008, continuing into January 2009. More than 500 earthquakes were detected under the northwest end of Yellowstone Lake. Northwest is we have West Thumb Lake, and northwest is also where we have the quake swarms going towards Montana, which is in another volcanic field there. And also, that's the area of the new thermal uh, deformation, the thermal area that has been discovered, and we assume that they will uh, after they uh, examined that area, now that they have started their geological field trips as of May 1st, from what I understand, they will be hopefully reverting with the, informa the information concerning what that is. Is it just ground swelling and heating causing the dead trees there? Or are there hydrothermal uh, events there, such as new springs or new geysers or new mud pots? They'll have to tell us what exactly is going on there because of the dying trees and the tremendous heat that's being given off um, from the ground. So December 2008, continued 2009, over 500 earthquakes detected in the northwest end of Yellowstone Lake in one week, seven day span, one week, with the largest registering 3.9 magnitude. Jacob Lowenstein, who was tasked with monitoring the activity for USGS revealed during this lecture, which was at Menlo Park, California, how his team were put on the alert, of course. And now there was another quake at the beginning of April that was at that area. Uh, it was in the border of Montana, just at the tip of the uh, border of, of the Yellowstone, uh, Wyoming area, bordering Montana and Idaho. Uh, that's where the uh, earthquake uh, swarms were taking place. There was a five magnitude earthquake quickly downgraded to 4.4 magnitude. Nevertheless, it was very big and uh, they never mentioned it at all in their Caldera Chronicles. I'm very sad to, to have noticed that. A lot of us have noticed that. We were waiting for them to come back explaining to us what that meant. Because 35 years ago, something similar happened and they were really on edge. They were really scared. They didn't know what that meant. 
and it really uh, put them on alert because it was, uh, and that was a 4.3 from what I remember. Now, this one they didn't even touch. They did not revert to this. They did not inform us about this whatsoever, as if it never happened. But we know it happened. So now, Lowenstein explained how um, with this seven-day quake swarm of 500 quakes in seven days, he explained how they spotted a linear trend of earthquakes which were heading towards the Yellowstone caldera. He said in 2014, here are a couple of maps that show you what has happened during that period of time. It turns out that the earthquakes were on a linear trend. It started with the blue, which are the early earthquakes, and then the red, which are the latest. They started at the south and they slowly moved north. This is another one of the cross sections. Though Mr. Lowenstein was confident the earthquake activity would not be enough to spark a volcanic eruption, he did, he did admit it was very unsettling. He added, this was pretty nervous time for us, not because there was a lot of earthquakes, but because people were getting ready, rather agitated about things happening beneath the lakes. As we know, the magma chamber is beneath the lakes. The roof of the magma chamber sits, is the floor, actually the floor of the lake. And uh, they have told us uh, from information from this same lecture that the waves of the water, of the, uh, the waves on the lake water, on the surface of the lake, if they're high enough and lap onto each other enough, if it's uh, breezy, windy, they are in danger of causing a quake which could affect the roof of the magma chamber. And they explained to us that the super, a super volcano is much different than a regular volcano because of the fact that a super volcano has such a huge magma chamber, therefore the roof has a bigger surface area. It could be thinner, it could be uh, more susceptible to, uh, because of its great surface area, susceptible to cracks. And even these quakes that uh, are uh, found to be close to the surface of the magma chamber, of the roof of the magma chamber, are very um, worrisome. Because a crack on the roof of the magma chamber, you can imagine what that would uh, entail that would make an eruption much easier, uh, God forbid. Now he added, this was a pretty nervous time for us, not because there was a lot of earthquakes, but because people were getting rather agitated about things happening beneath the lakes. Lakes freak people out for some reason because they can't see what is happening. It's not just lakes, we're talking about the lakes that are, that are above uh, volcanoes, of course. Now, so people, he said, just hypothesized all sorts of crazy stuff, and it was a very nervous time. There was a lot of earthquakes, but there was never any steam or any more than small earthquakes. Uh, and we have the map here showing us the tremendous amount of earthquake swarm into the lake. He revealed during the same lecture how he spotted a lot of activity heading to the park. Pointing to the graph of the earthquake activity, he added, these are seismograms, and they are from the south and north end of the lake. All of the data is from December 27, 2008, and come from Yellowstone Seismic Network. You have the time starting from early top and late bottom, and each 15 minutes is represented by the back line, so four would be an hour. And these are all earthquakes. Every time you get a squiggle, you're looking at an earthquake. Dr. Lowenstein went on to reveal, although the earthquakes were not particularly strong, they were still felt in the park. He added, in this particular day, there was a lot of activity. The biggest one was a magnitude four. There you go. There were also ones, twos, and threes a number of felt earthquakes. It was in December though, so there was not a lot of people around, 
but there were maybe 15, 20 people who were living near the lake at the time and they felt it. It happened for about two weeks and the earthquakes were on a lineal trend, he said. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you. Thank you.